Hello everyone. We're going to try to do a short video to at least introduce you to the rise of feudalism in Europe and Japan in a comparative fashion because that makes a lot of sense to do. So let's see how this goes. <clears throat> so feudalism. When we use the word feudalism, um, we are talking about decentralized control of a region. Um, and we'll see that that happens for a variety of reasons. And that rather than being hyper-centralized, we are decentralized and broken down into the self-sustained communities. Um, in the case of Europe, we'll see that those communities were pretty isolated, less so in Japan. All right, but um, we are broken into these communities, and there's often a lot of conflict, at least in this era, and it leads to this heavy reliance on our warrior class. Um, so when we think of feudalism, we should think of it as both a social and an economic system. We'll look at the economic systems within the manners and the shoin. Um, and socially, we have not a huge departure from social class systems that we've seen before, but some features that are unique and important to notice. Um, and the basic way that it worked is that we have some sort of regional leader, often a monarch, we'll see in Japan these are generals, who manage the great expanse of land and then either give parts of that land away or some power away in return for uh, loyalty, in return for taxes um, and military service um, from the warrior class. Um, and uh, they'll hand that down to some sort of noble class. And then the nobles are the ones who interact more with the peasants, um, known as serfs in Europe. And then those peasants do everything, manage the land, grow the food, do the fishing, make the crafts, um, and are very reliant on the nobility to be protected in this unstable time period. Um, in both of these regions of the world, in Japan and Europe, social mobility is really limited. In Europe, it's almost impossible to move up or down um, the social ladder. So if you're born a peasant, you're stuck a peasant. In Japan, you have a bit more freedom, but it's still not a time period of people, you know, starting from the bottom, right, and making their way up to some higher social class. Um, so that's a, a really important feature that I want you to note. Very little social mobility. All right, so why? Why do both of these regions collapse or shift into feudalism at the same time, right? It's kind of spooky. Japan and Europe are in absolutely no contact with each other, and yet they end up doing the same exact thing at about the same exact time. So it might be aliens, or we could just look at some somewhat similar causations here. Um, for Europe, it all has to do with the fall of the Roman Empire, specifically the collapse of the western portion of the Roman Empire. So we know that due to various decisions, the West was very weakened in the Roman Empire, which led to various Germanic invasions just pummeling Western Europe. Um, and this led to this region of the world being very decentralized, the infrastructure falling apart, a great deal of instability. And since there was so much danger um, and war between all these groups, we're going to see that it falls into this period of relative isolation uh, we see a lot less trade because it's just too dangerous and the West, it's not very productive, so they have nothing to trade. So they're not going to be trading very much. These different powers in the West won't be even interacting quite that much. That'll happen in the high Middle Ages, but at this point, it's kind of like everyone is just going internal and just in survival mode just to try to recover from the very hard fall of the Western Roman Empire. Um, we go back to being an extremely agricultural economy rather than have larger, more sophisticated crafts that were made in the Roman Empire. So it's like taking a few steps back. Um, and so every all trade, for the most part, um, is local. That's why when we study them, that's why the Vikings will be so important. The Vikings are some of the only groups in the early Middle Ages that are reaching out and connecting these societies via trade. And it's funny because the Vikings are also part of the reason that people don't want to go beyond their local manners because the Vikings are, are dangerous. So um, in some way they're causing less trade, but they're also providing a lot of connection and trade. Um, and one thing I want us to think about in terms of what makes Europe's feudal system more un um, or different from Japan's is that um, the, the lowest class in feudal Europe are the serfs. Um, you can use the word peasants, but serfs is a better word to use. Um, and the serfs have like no mobility whatsoever. We'll see the Japanese peasants have a great deal more freedom. Um, and a reason that we see very 
rigid class systems in, in the European feudal system is because the social system of Rome just like shifts in the feudal period. So the people who used to be the slaves, and remember that a third of the Roman population were slaves, they become the serfs of the feudal era. Um, because as everything is collapsing, it's not like you know, the Roman Empire collapses and they're like, yay, we're free, and they're just running around. Of course, some people, I'm sure, found ways to reinvent them, their, themselves and their families and become important in terms of military protection. But the majority of serfs you know, didn't have weapons. You needed protection, and so they become even more reliant on the upper classes who do have the ability to form armies and to arm themselves. Um, the patricians, the upper class, just shift and become the nobility within Europe. So we just kind of have a, a shift, and it leads to this rigid um, social system where it's really hard to move up uh, the, the, the hierarchy. In Japan, um, first off, there's no previous slave class, so the peasants enjoy more freedom. It's still, they're still, you know, poor, and they're still reliant on the nobility, especially for protection. Um, but as we'll get into, they do have the ability to just up and leave to go to another um, manner or showin if they feel that they are not being treated properly or paid properly. Whereas if you're a serf in Europe, you're, you're done. You have, you're stuck within um, that manner. You have to pay your debts to uh, the noble who owns your land. Um, but in Japan, the feudal system emerges uh, very much due to the rise of the nobility that is happening from around 700 to about 1000 or so CE. Um, so as Japan has more relations with China and Korea, not only is their population growing, but the upper classes are growing to be richer and richer and richer. So now there's a far more stark difference between the upper and the lower classes. Um, and the nobility will be able to fund their own armies, um, at, which will compete against the imperial army. And over time, they can have very powerful armies, um, which can make them somewhat more independent from the government and put them at odds with other noble families that are raising their own armies. Um, so there is a great deal of war that's happening in the feudal era, but there are periods of connection. There's still more internal trade in Japan. It's not as dangerous as Europe, right? So Japan won't be as isolated as Europe. Japan in this time period will continue to trade with China and Korea and other regional powers. Um, so they'll benefit from that, and they'll continue to trade with each other with periods of time that are rough with lots of war. So I would argue that Japan is not as isolated, can benefit from cultural diffusion and trade far more than Europe, and of course the peasants have a great deal more freedom. So just as a reminder, um, or a glimpse into what Europe looks like around 600 CE, um, so rather than have one large empire, we start to break down to the, into these larger kingdoms, um, I'm sorry, regional kingdoms um, that were forged via those Germanic tribes that invaded Western Europe. Um, so um, right here we have the Franks, which were one group, the Visigoths and the Lombards here, and then you know, all these other different groups. So even though it looks like they owned large swaths of land, they didn't have centralized control. So within these, this purple region and this, um, what is that, green, green region, whatever, um, there's all these tiny little mini kingdoms, you could say. Um, so don't look at that and be, you know, misguided in terms of thinking that they're super centralized. They're not. Um, definitely decentralized. We have one moment of centralization within the medieval period, um, and that is the Frankish kingdom under Charlemagne, um, which um, is shown here in the light green um, and then expanded under Charlemagne to these other darker green territories were taken into his empire. So we'll get more specific information on that in class, um, but this is our one empire um, in this time period of centralization. Um, so um, for the most part, we're decentralized in the feudal period, except for this one moment um, in the like 700 through 900 uh, under the Carolingian Empire. This is a setup to the European feudal system. It's a pretty strict social and economic system. So the way that it works, is at the top, there's some sort of political leader, monarch, um, I just noted it as kings right here, and they're the ones who technically own and are ruling over a large expanse of land. Um, those kings will grant what are called benefices or fiefs, um, so property or you know a certain amount of horses or whatever, to the nobility, and then the nobility manages that land. 
um, as the nobility manages that land, they also need to raise armies that are ultimately loyal to the king above the nobles, but immediately report back to those nobles. And it's important to note that the knights are pretty much only growing out of the noble class itself. So the knights are an extension of the nobility. Um, the knights in Europe are ruled by the code of chivalry. We'll learn more about that later. And then uh, the nobles will rule over the serfs who have very, very little um, mobility. Uh, ultimately, they're almost like indentured servants to the nobles. Um, and then the serfs will work the land, kick up much of their crops and whatnot to the nobility in exchange to be protected and, of course, to be fed. Um, and all of that reports back to the king. Um, but it should be noted that the serfs are so responsible for the recovery of Europe. The hard work and the innovations of the serfs within all of these local manors allow Europe to recover from the fall of Rome in, I mean, I mean, I guess in a pretty swift way, all things considered. So if you look at the populations at the bottom of the slide there, um, in 200 CE, before the fall of Rome, Europe is at about 36 million people and then drops 10 million people. Um, and so due to the efforts of the serfs, they're able to recover their population by the year 1000 and set Europe up in a way that will continue its development. Um, and this largely has to do with a lot of the agricultural innovations that these serfs put forth. Um, one of which is the heavy plow. It might sound really simple to have like this heavy iron plow, but we have to remember that Europe was in total disarray, so it's a pretty useful tool. Um, also, we'll see that they develop a lot of cottage industries. We'll see that they grow essentially into guilds in the late Middle Ages, but we're recovering our craft industries um, within these manors, and at first, it's just enough to sustain themselves. Um, at this point, so through the year, I don't know, 1100, 1200, pretty local economies, and then eventually it grows beyond those local economies. So for now, it's just enough to get by, not enough surplus to sustain long-distance trade, but they're recovering. This is what the manors would look like, these uh, self-sufficient manors. Um, note the three fields. The peasant classes or the serf classes of the feudal era develop a three-field system, which plenty of other societies had done a rotating crop system in the past, but you know, you're a little late to the game often. Um, so here they develop that, which is going to help their agricultural yields. And anything else you could ever want is on the manor. So we got what well, we got the mill for all the grains, and there's a blacksmith for all the tools that you need, and a barn for the animals and gallows for the killing, and the church for the praying, and all that stuff. So um, we will learn that Charlemagne, under the Carolingian Empire, gives kind of a standard to the setup of the medieval manor, but this is how you would generally, you know, see a manor. And so they could recover from Europe in a self-sustained, semi-isolated way. All right, so Japan, um, the setup of Japanese feudalism, similarities, but some differences. And as a reminder, as from, you know, 10 minutes ago, um, we see a shift to feudalism because the emperor is really losing power because he's a far and away entity, but the nobility has been rising in prominence and wealth and raising their own armies. And so we see many clan wars erupt throughout Japan. Um, but instead of a king being the leader in some sort of regional um, power, the shogun will be the powerful, the most powerful person in the local feudal governments. Um, shoguns are, are the military generals. Um, and just as kind of give a little bit of insight to what I'm talking about in terms of these feudal societies or these clans. Um, so this is a map of Japan and each one of these colors is a different um, noble clan or shogunate uh, that would be ruling over the region and within it have its own sets of armies um, and the hierarchy that I'm just about to show you. Um, so, but also, as I said before, yes, there's a decent amount of war at certain periods of time between like 1000 and about 1600, uh, but there's also extensive periods of semi-peace, which allows Japan to have internal trade and also to be trading with China and uh, Korea and some other places. So this is a, an extended version of the hierarchy of Japan. So at the top is the emperor, who's just a figurehead. Um, and below the emperor are the shoguns who rule all of all of those little colored sections that I showed you in that map. Um, similar to the setup of the European feudal system, the shogun then grants land and power to the noble class, which are known as the daimyo in Japanese feudalism. The daimyo then raise their local armies that are ultimately local, uh, loyal to the shogun. Those are the samurai. 
there are samurai that uh, have been freed from masters, and so you can pay them, called ronin. Um, and underneath that are the peasants, which is 90% of the populations, um, also including fishermen, which and fishing is so important to the Japanese economy, um, so um, they're going to be part of this class. And we'll note that this hierarchy is about power and honor. So it's interesting that underneath the peasants in Japan are artisans, and at the bottom of the hierarchy are merchants. So it doesn't mean that the merchants were broke. Indeed, the merchants would be rich, but they're valued the least in not just Japanese societies, but Confucian societies. Because in Confucian societies, in these social hierarchies, you're valued for what you provide to society. Um, and of course, like, you know, the, up, the most upper classes, these generals and the lords, you know, are providing stability and order or whatever. Obviously, the peasants are providing food. And it's seen that the merchants, they actually do nothing but sell the labor of others or sell the products of labors of others. Thus, they are considered, quote unquote, mean people um, and at the bottom of the social scale. This is a more simplified version of it. And if this is what all you remember about the Japanese feudal system, that's fine. You can kind of skip the ronin and stuff like that. I mean, it's fun, but whatever. Um, so I went over that before. Uh, but the one point that I really want to make, and we'll learn more about the samurai in another context, is that the peasants of Japan have more rights than the European peasants. Right? As I said before, since there was no real slave class before in Japan, we have free people just shifting to different roles within a new economic and political system. So peasants were paid wages uh, if they had the right to like protest and strike. And if they didn't like the daimyo they were working for, they could just up and leave to a different place. They were not tied to the land. They weren't tied to the daimyo. So far more freedom. Um, and the term for manners or the kind of similar self-sustained communities in Japan or Japanese feudalism uh, are called shoan. Um, and this is an old document of, uh, of, of shoan. Um, so if you note here, um, the breakdown, let me get a little thing going on. The, the way that the, the land was set up, if you look, are these perfect little grids. Because as a reminder, um, the Japanese embrace the equal field system of uh, the Tang Chinese. And so that kind of plays out in a lot of land grant or land management systems for a long period of time. So rather than have these three field systems, the peasants are really in charge of their own land so long as they are paying taxes and are loyal to the upper classes, they're pretty good to go. And this is a samurai, which we'll learn more about later. Um, I'm going to stop there, and we will see each other in class. <laughs>